we can put her into one. Hello, Lenny. My name's Morgan. I'm one of the doctors. There are over 63,000 junior doctors working in Britain's hospitals. You squeeze my hand if you understand what I've said. As young as 23, they are the foot soldiers of the NHS. And how are your bowels and waterworks? Yeah, it is not glamorous. It is not glamorous. Hey, baby. Hey. They'll welcome us into the world. Aw, awesome. Do we have a pulse? No. No. They will be there at the end. So stop. Cardiac arrest on Foyngen Ward. Emergency. Right. All right, don't worry. But they are working in hospitals that are treating more patients than ever before. We are utterly, utterly full. We've got just no room, no beds, no space. Everything is stretched. We haven't got a lot more to give, and something needs to change. These doctors have become a symbol of the state of the NHS. We are doing our best. We are working our hardest, but it's just not enough. Filmed in one regional hospital at the height of the junior doctor crisis, this series is about the young doctors who are the future of our health service. To survive as a junior doctor, you must have courage. Courage to cope with what we see day in, day out. Courage to deal with people at the very worst moments of their lives. And courage to work in a system that can't cope with the pressure it's under. Gonna get my scrubs out the ready. <sighs> Twenty-four year old Morgan is a second year doctor. You can attract quite a lot of attention in this beautiful green. She's a few weeks into a four-month rotation in Northampton General's A and D. I just kind of look how many ambulances are outside. So at the moment, I'm not going to curse anything, but not too bad. Morgan's the youngest doctor in the department. Hello. How's it looking? Or do I not dare ask? Oh, dear. If you told my mum when I was 15 that I was going to be an A&E doctor, she would have just laughed. Have a sit down. We'll just wait for the other doctor to come in. I'm probably one of the most emotional people that anyone knows. I'm also extremely squeamish and terrified of hospitals myself. I hate needles. Deep breaths in. So why the hell would I go and do a career where I'm dealing with them every day? I, just, I think it's mad. I even question it myself. <laughs> Northampton A&E emergency phone can I help? Morgan's working in a department that's seen more patients than ever before. The current waiting time to be seen by an emergency doctor is approximately four hours. And like many NHS hospitals, they have a shortage of emergency doctors. You okay? Do you want some more pain relief? No one goes into emergency medicine because it's the easy option. I can't find the notes. I think if you're not good under pressure, they're going to struggle working in, in the environment that we work in. They've met some of the number. That means they're in a major cubicle. I don't think there's any other bit of medicine which is as fast-paced, as demanding, as chaotic, oh. and really as challenging as working in Amy. There we go. Please go, Dr. Teresa. Please, Dr. Teresa. Thank you. Oh, give me strength. Halfway through her shift, Morgan is called to resus, the area for patients in a life-threatening condition. I'm terrified of resus. It's probably the only place in the hospital where you get people coming in so acutely unwell. I think I'm going to find it difficult to see those emotional things and just leave them at the door. I'm quite worried that I'm going to keep a lot of things with me because I know that's me and I know that's what I've done in the past. We have a gentleman, I think, from the brain injury unit. 
who's no to have pulmioedema and is coming in with query pulmioedema. So that means lots of fluid on their lungs, um, usually due to heart failure problems. Morgan's patient is a 61-year-old man called Lenny. Hello. A previous brain injury has left him unable to communicate. I'm just going to have a little listen to your chest now, OK? I'm going to go get a chest picture of the book. Morgan urgently needs a blood sample. But the nurses are struggling to take one. Are you asking me? Yeah. I've not done one before. Yeah. It's going to need a femoral scan. Yeah. I'm struggling. She must take the blood herself from the femoral vein in Lenny's groin. Femoral stab is really difficult to do. And you're really aware that it's going to cause that person some pain and distress. I know we've had a bit of a difficult time getting some blood from you, so we're going to have to take it from the groin area, if that's OK. I put myself in Lenny's situation. I can only dare to imagine what he must be feeling. If that was me, I'm, I would be absolutely terrified. It keeps disappearing. You feel a bit of a sting, Lenny. If you aren't able to separate yourself from your patient and create that professional distance, then it can be very difficult to perform procedures. I can't get anything from there. I'm struggling to feel a good pulse down here. You do have to be able to switch off the compassion a little, just so you can pull yourself together and get on with the job at hand. I really struggling. Couldn't get anything in. Just, it was all over the place. After three failed attempts, Morgan has to call in her registrar for help. <laughs> you really do feel a bit useless sometimes. I don't want to feel that way. I want to feel like I can look after people and I can do it. We all need to show empathy and understanding, but I think if you leave yourself wide open to um, the emotional distress of every case you see, coming to work the next day will be impossible. He pulls on my heartstrings. I just want to make him feel better. Okay, so I'm going to put the local anaesthetic in. It's going to sting, OK? Sharp scratch. 26-year-old Dan is a third-year doctor. He signed up for a career in emergency medicine. OK. I love recess. Feeling all right? <coughs> Good. It's what you imagine when you think of being a doctor. It's the cool stuff. Let's put tubes in, let's stab things, let's put lines in. Let's get excited and let's stay calm while we're excited and let's not enjoy this, but let's also enjoy it. I'm one of the A&E consultants. I've come to admire all the handiwork that's going on here. Cool. Yeah, so it's gone in absolutely fine. Guide wire's out. It's in. It's bubbling. Yeah, it's pretty quick, right here. Is he conscious? But not every patient requires Dan to take a purely clinical approach. He's quite down like he was quite combative when I first got to him. <laughs> Anthony is a 70-year-old with advanced dementia who's come in from a care home. He's in respiratory failure. His wife, Gillian, is waiting to hear the prognosis. I've never thrown myself too much into the human side of things. Keep your arms still for me. 
I tend to focus on the medical complaint. This is an unwell person. It doesn't matter about the rest of it. I don't want to be the person who is, is holding the hand of the relative and kind of having a little cry with them, because that's not what I'm about. I want to be the person who's, you know, doing the bits. Which sounds awfully cold, doesn't it? Hmm. His quality of life is very quite poor. poor. Anthony is so frail that the doctors decide to limit his treatment. I think this is a very reasonable and merciful thing which we're doing. Thank you. Anything else? No. No. Dan is given the responsibility of informing Gillian. With breaking bad news, I think you have to approach the situation with real compassion. I think it's really important that you can hold on to your own humanity and have the ability to um, connect with people. Sorry, making the racket. I'm, like, okay. I'm Dan, I'm one of the A&E doctors. Hello. Um, so how much have they told you about what's going on and things? I just, I went to see him this afternoon. Um, and we thought he got a cold and a, and a bad throat. At the moment, his oxygen levels are very low. Okay. Um, and he had some bits in his throat, like tablets and things, okay. that were in his airway. Right. So we think they've gone down the wrong way, essentially, and they've gone onto his chest rather than going oh, down nice. into his stomach, um, which might be causing him to have a, an infection in his chest and making his breathing quite difficult. Okay. We've. With him being in the in the home and things, he's got a um, a note to say that he didn't want to be resuscitated. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So there are more treatments that we could give, but at the moment, with him being in the state he's in, um, I'm not sure that they'd be appropriate. No. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to make sure you understood yeah. where we were. Yeah. And right. um, do you want a cup of tea or anything? I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that was awful, Daniel. You idiot. Me. Basically, I did it all wrong. Um, I should have... I'm not sure the bedside was the most appropriate place when we've got a very good relative's room. I don't know, it didn't feel... It didn't feel fluid and fluent, and I didn't feel happy that I'd got across what I was trying to get across in a sensitive and compassionate way. It felt a bit like I was kind of panicking. And I think I, there was an element of that, because as I was getting through it and I was thinking, I'm just talking now, I need to stop talking, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only do your patients need you to have a cool head in a crisis, they also need you to have a heart as well. I think that makes a very good doctor, if you're able to do both of those. If all else fails, offer them a hot drink. At least enough for tea, I'm awful at making tea. Mm -hmm. to come in because um, I've accidentally sprayed deodorant in my eye. He sprayed the deodorant in his eyes. Like most NHS hospitals, a and &E is the main entry point for Northampton General's patients. Healthcare through an acute hospital is actually fairly simple. Patients arrive at the front door at our a &E departments, and they're assessed, they're treated, and when they're well enough, we discharge the mess. Um, now, that works beautifully when you've got good flow from front to back door. But in mid-October, there's a surge in admissions, and the hospital starts to become congested. Oh, my goodness. I'm not even kidding you. As I was walking here, about three ambulances went past. I was just like... After two months in A&E, Morgan finds herself on the front line of the winter pressures. Look at this. What the hell? So how long has she been like this? The main issues we have, and that most acute hospitals have, is that we have too many patients presenting at the front door. It's been 12 hours nearly since she did it. They are increasingly elderly, they're increasingly frail, and they need a lot more support than they ever used to. And there's not enough social support out there to get them home, so they're stuck in the beds, and the whole system grinds to a halt. Is it Miss, Mrs? A&E is filling up with patients. They are being treated but with the hospital almost at capacity, it's taking time to admit them. What's the longest wait time? 20 hours and 16 minutes. That is crazy. 
it's like you've poured some really thick fluid down the drain and it just got stuck. So we've got a, like a little bath, all these patients in and in, no one coming out. So it's just going to fill and then it's just going to flood. I was in the cubicle round there, but I've been promoted to the corridor. I just don't know what they're going to do with everybody. Do you want to see me panicking today? It's looking particularly horrible. So there's 17 patients in A&E from yesterday. Alison is the site manager. She's responsible for allocating the hospital's beds. So you've got that many at almost 20 hours yes. in A&E? Yes. On a trolley? Yes. <clears throat> How do you feel about that? I think it's terrible. When there's a bed shortage, the hospital works to a colour-coded system of alerts. What level of alert is the hospital on? Red. <clears throat> and what's the next level of escalation? Black. It's Alison's job to try and free up beds for new patients. Did you look at any? Yes, two, two. Thank you. So I'm moving a medical patient down to a surgical ward. So I need to check the notes. I look at the patient, make sure they're suitable, and then the top patient from A&E can come round. Have we got any rooms to review? In A&E, Morgan's under pressure to see patients quickly and not admit anyone unless they're acutely unwell. Is there a Terence Fenn? Hello. Terence has come in with lower back pain. Have a wonder down. My name's Morgan, I'm one of the doctors. Hello. You really, really feel that pressure on you, but you don't want to rush your clinical assessment of someone because that's when you can make mistakes and that's when it can be dangerous. Can you lift one of your legs at a time up like this? How's that? That's OK. Brilliant. Other one? Yeah, that one's easy. You're like a gymnast. Brilliant. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really there in the back of your mind. Do I really need to send this person to hospital or, or can they go home? Because if I send that person to hospital and I give that bed to that person, what if someone else, even sicker, needs that bed and I've just given that one away? I can't really see anything, obviously, that's causing the pain that you're having. We can certainly try and send you home with some painkillers to see if that eases it off. OK. OK. Yes, thanks. Thank you. No problem. Nice to meet you, too. Adult red call 10 minutes. Adult red call 10 minutes. Over the next few days, the number of patients continues to rise. It's quite busy, isn't it? And one day, late in October, things come to a head. What the hell? Have you seen outside? I know, I'm saying that way. My mouth just dropped. I was not expecting that. Oh, my God. I've never seen it like that before. I was genuinely shocked. Resus is now full. What's your ETA? Shit. But the ambulances keep on coming. Four minutes away. What can we do? With nowhere to unload their patients, the paramedics are having to stay with them. The danger of patients not being seen is you've got an undiagnosed patient who could have a cardiac arrest, could have a massive GI bleed, could have a stroke at any time. What I absolutely do not want is a patient to die in an ambulance or on our corridor who's alone and has not been seen by anybody. OK, and do you normally look this pale? Yeah. yeah. Morgan is doing assessments in the yeah. corridor. OK, well, I'll request the x-ray so we can get a good view. We'll get that sorted and then we'll get you seen to him. All right. There's a lot of very unwell people here and there's only a, a limited amount of doctors. You start to just feel a little bit... Like, just, I'm feeling like I'm being pulled everywhere. Uh, add him to the list. With patients continuing to arrive, the hospital goes on to its highest level of alert. It's looking very bad. So we've just run the report and we're on black. So I'm just waiting for the exec team to get back to me to see what the plan of action is on that one. Black alert is when there's people still coming in, but there's nowhere to put them. 
So basically the number coming in is exceeding the number going out and we haven't got spare capacity. We get to the point where we are genuinely thinking, can we treat these sick people? We have sent a message out to the ambulance people and to the local GP services just to say that we're in a very difficult position here. Code black means there's a significant risk to patient safety. OK, everybody, should we, should we make a start? Carl calls an urgent meeting of the heads of department. We have triggered black on the escalation process. There are seven ambulances that we're holding at the moment with seven patients on the corridor. So we've got to dig ourselves out of it. Grab every single consultant you can get your hands on to go through the patients and really have some <laughs> really robust discussions around patients. They do they really need to be here. Move her to the discharge suite now and I'll get the next lady round in half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Where's my okay. patient? Danny feels most of the time a little bit like a sinking ship. They were constantly bailing out water. You're panicking. I think they're getting a bit frustrated at me. It's almost become routine for us to have to put in emergency measures. <laughs> oh, it's mental. You literally just want to have a remote and just press pause. You feel completely stretched beyond any limits that is acceptable. It's a horrible, horrible feeling, just feeling like you are absolutely losing this battle. A young woman has collapsed in the main waiting room. Hello, Ella. We've got a, a lady with a PV bleed who's just like not really responsive. Yeah. She just doesn't look right. Into one. No, just... She just mentioned something about losing her baby. Ella, are you currently pregnant at the moment? You were pregnant two months ago. The sensor wouldn't come out. You had a hemorrhage, did you? Uh, yeah. You're doing really well. There's, I know there's a lot of people around you at the moment. Can you open your eyes for me? Yes. Brilliant, that's OK. No, 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 no. That's fine. Just get what we can and get a stat bag of flu. Yeah. Yeah. I just ran in and she was just, like, completely unresponsive. My arms are literally shaking. Is she perked up? Yeah. Good. It's much better colour. Good. She was, like, genuinely white when I saw her. My hands won't stop shaking, we need to stop shaking. <laughs> you okay? Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Why's everyone been asking if I'm okay? Gonna be okay? That was stressful. It's really hard to think straight when you're getting asked a million and one questions. Can I just write up some pain relief for this and check that ECG? Oh my God. At one point I just want the whole ground to just like envelop me, swallow me up and just kind of curl into a ball and just wait for it to all end. It's the morning after one of the busiest days of the year at Northampton General. It's the turn in this corner that always gets me worried, because that's when you start to see them piling up if they are there. Oh, that's fine. Nobody in waiting area too, which is always nice. Morning. It's better. That's miraculous. It is miraculous, isn't it? I think we had a, a concerted effort where everybody pulled together um, for the safety of the patients in A&E. And it's got us in a better position today. Longest wait is 12 hours. Still not appropriate, but better. I suggest we take ourselves off black, go on to red, but we've got a lot of work to do to get ourselves into position for this weekend. It's 10.45. Pain and weakness in legs, three days prescribed codeine, but no relief, but he said it was helping. Morgan's on a day shift. Toppy, I've got a patient that's come back. And now I don't know. Same, but worse now. Terence originally came in with lower back pain. 
But after Morgan sent him home, his conditions deteriorated. I'm hoping there isn't anything I could have done differently. Because it's, he's very different today than he was the other day. One of my biggest fears as a junior doctor was um, the idea that I might miss something and might miss a diagnosis or make a wrong diagnosis. You have such a responsibility. People come to you for help. And if you miss something, somebody could die. Somebody could have an illness that isn't diagnosed in a timely manner, and the outcome could be so much worse if it isn't picked up early. Hello, Terence. Well, here we are. Hello. I knew I recognised your name when it was came up oh, on the screen. Worrying, worrying, I'm so sorry you're back. How are you? Well, yes. <laughs> not good. Know. Not good, actually. So where is the actual pain? Most of it is no. now in my backside. In your back, OK. No, backside. In your, in your bottom? Uh, yes, and down my back, back of my legs, leg particularly. Here. OK, so that's, and that's front, changed and as well. And the front of the legs. You getting any pain there? Yes. Where's, so, where's it getting pain? There. Yeah. And around the back. Down the back. OK. Oh, 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 That's all oh. right. You just relax for me. What is going on? Oh, I'm stressed. Because I'm worried that I missed something. Morgan asks her registrar for advice. This gentleman presented with some lower back pain, which had settled when he came to us, mm. and bilateral lower leg pain, which was the front and the back of his legs. Sure. And he had some codeine, and the pain really improved. Yeah. Since then, he's not really got any better, and if anything, it's all got worse. He's such a lovely gentleman, and I'm just a bit worried that I might have missed something. Did we do a triple A scan? No. Aortic scan? No. So can we use that's what I'm, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm running. Yeah, yeah. Is it around yeah. here? I'm just worrying that we've missed something like a triple A. Um, a abdominal aortic aneurysm. If Morgan has missed a triple A, Terence's life could be in danger. Morgan's told me all about you, and yeah, yeah. yeah, we're just a bit concerned that we're not getting getting on top of things with you. Oh, oh. oh where does it happen? Oh, that's my back and my legs. I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh. So sorry. I wasn't expecting that. We couldn't see anything obvious, such as a dilated aorta. She wants me to do a examination of his back passage just to check the tone and get a bladder scan and then she's going to come and review the patient as well. Can I pop in? Hello. Yes. We need to make sure that you can feel your back passage. You know where I'm coming from with yes, this? Yes, yes, yes. So I need to have a feel around your back passage to check that you can feel there okay. and I'll ask you to clinch if that's OK. Yeah. So, okay, well, Cheers, we'll, we'll come and let you know <laughs> once we've come in. OK, that's fine. How am I finding today? To ask that question right now. I was finding it okay, and now I'm now I'm just a bit wondering if I could have done anything differently. Confidence can be knocked very quickly. It's a fragile thing, but it's an important thing because an underconfident doctor will question everything they've done. The patient will see that lack of confidence, and they won't trust the decisions that are being made. I hate this feeling. We got Joel Maxwell, please. However, an overconfident doctor, in my eyes, will perhaps take chances that shouldn't be taken. As seniors, we have to keep people in check and supervise, but I think it's a tightrope that you have to learn to walk within yourself. Dan is working in the A and E paediatric unit. He's had a bit of a wheezy cough for a couple, of, like a week or two now. He hasn't improved at all. Mm. He's still very chesty. His patient is a six-month-old baby called Joel. It sounds a bit, a little bit like bronchiolitis, which is a viral infection that comes on around this time of year. And because of how old he is and the fact that he's come in with a temperature, I need to go and have a chat to my consultant. Okay. It's one of our policies, so yes. I'll just go and do that and then I'll pop back. Is that all right? Okay, so I should stay here. If you don't mind, yes. yeah. Thank you. I've got a six-month-old. He's been upper respiratory tract via relief for the last week. 
um, is feeding uh, about 50% of what he normally would, still having wet nappies, I think it's bronchiolitis. And uh, intercostal recession? No. Is there any tracheal tuck? No. So then he needs to come. Let's arrange for a chest x-ray. Chest x-ray? OK. Dan thinks it's a common infection, but his registrar, Nickel, wants to rule out something more serious. It looks okay to me. That's his x-ray, boss. He has infection going on here. I, I mean, we can give the peds reg a call. We have the x-ray. Got infection here. I think he needs admission. He has infection going on. It's not clear lung fields. So Nichols concerned that that's a pneumonia. Do you see a pneumonia? I don't think that's a fair question. Dan decides to ask for a second opinion from a more senior doctor, the A and E consultant. I've got a six-month-old, a temperature of 38.2, sounds a bit bronchiolitis-y. Um, we've done an X-ray, and Nick was concerned it might be some consolidation. Yeah, I think I'll just go and have a listen to his chest myself. From my initial assessment, I thought this was some bronchiolitis, and I, I was I was quite happy. And then I think I'm a bit concerned now that I'm doing the wrong thing. Because really? yeah, I think Nichols kind of giving me a bit of a oh, I've done completely the wrong thing. But anyway, we'll see what you think. He's very cute. <laughs> Hello. There's been a bit of discussion about um, Joel's X-ray. There's a, uh, an area on it that looks like infection to me, and I think he'd be best to come into hospital for a short period of time to have some antibiotics. Yeah. <laughs> See you there, dude. <laughs> Can I ask about it? Yeah. I think if I'd have seen him and not discussed him with anyone, I don't think I'd have done an X-ray in the first place. OK. You'd normally expect to keep a bronchitis to be yeah. better after a week. Thank you. Yeah, Dan. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you were right. <laughs> you know your stuff. You build up this kind of persona of confidence and, and competence and all of this in your head, and you say, oh, I'm good at this, I can do this. Then when you find out that what you actually did was probably not what a consultant would have done, it knocks the foundations from under this thing you've built about yourself. Dan's not the only one worried about their diagnosis. After further investigation, Morgan's patient Terence is being blue-lighted to Leicester for an emergency operation. He has a compressed nerve in his spine. Do you ever doubt yourself? All the time. That has been a thing that I've done from day one, from growing up. Always, always been a confidence thing. I'm someone that can't shut that doubt away. What if I did miss it? What if I really don't know what I'm doing? Pediatric red call, 10 minutes. Pediatric red call, 10 minutes. Two weeks later, Morgan's called to resus to see a baby with sepsis. She and her registrar decide to move the patient to the paediatric unit for observation. OK. Very well. We've just worked out her EDS and she's scoring a 1, but we still feel that she's no, more she's than not. that. And the temperature was 37. We've got her obs right now. No, 37, 190. 193. So how old is she? She's so six months. The paediatric team have a system for measuring how sick a patient is, and the nurse is questioning Morgan's scoring. She thinks the baby's too sick to leave resus. So parental concern is one. Yeah, that's one. Is one. So it was West two Friday. on OBS and one on parental concern. It's all right. Take a breath. Doesn't matter. Read of your rest doesn't matter. Anyone that questions me and my ability has instantly got to the core weakness to me. Press that little button there. She's like, ugh. But it's all about the confidence thing. Do you know what I'm getting upset? What's wrong? 
What's wrong? I don't even know why I got Shut upset. Shut up, yeah, Pin. Just sit down. Is a kid in recess who's septic. He's allowed to make you upset. You're already on edge and then somebody's telling you you're doing it wrong. Oh, it just feels really silly. Why? I don't know why I'm getting upset. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. She was just, like, questioning like, everything I was trying to work, just do. And then they're not scoring one, they're scoring this. And I'm, like, just trying to work it out. Oh, I'm, like, genuinely feel, like, humiliated right now. Okay. <sighs> Just take your time. Don't march out there too early, cos you'll just go off again and you'll feel worse. Someone pays on, like, that one insecurity. Am I gonna? Yeah. I need to get a thicker shell, don't I? I don't want to go back there. Oh, I'm getting that. I can't wait for this shift to be over. What time is it? Oh, my God, I've still got, like, eight hours of this shift. Eight and a half, technically. I can't actually show my face out there. Oh, stop giving yourself such a hard time. Bloody hell. So I'm feeling pretty down in the dumps just about everything right now. I just feel like... My confidence has taken an absolute battering. And it's just been one thing after the next. Did you try and do this intentionally to kill yourself or to harm yourself? Yes. I just want to see something good. The shift to go without worries or doubts. Shifts are relentless. And what you see just emotionally bashes you. Well, she was actively vomiting. <laughs> I'm physically and mentally absolutely exhausted. I'm just actually, for the first time, just beginning to question why the hell I'm doing this and if I'm even good enough to do any of this. So this is when I'm home. This is everyone. Hello! Hello. 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 This is my house. This is my dog. This is my granny. Hello. This is my dog. Morgan's gone back to her parents' farm. It's so nice just to be home. No clocks, no um, four-hour waiting targets, and just to be me, Morgan, just a normal 24-year-old standing in beautiful countryside, finally getting a bit of fresh air. She has a few days off from A&E. I find it really difficult to just leave things behind, um, especially if I've seen something really sad or I've dealt with something quite distressing. Actually, when you get home, or when you come home home, like I am now, I actually have a chance to think about everything that I've seen and all of the stuff that I've dealt with before I used to break down at everything and now I've learned to just become a little bit less emotional, but things still bother me. been upset by anything you've seen? When I was in my first year, there was a lady on the medical ward who was a bit unwell and we couldn't quite work out why, and she'd been to the CT scanner and it turned out that she'd got an aortic dissection pretty much from top to bottom. And she started to go off really very quickly, as you'd expect with, you know, your main blood vessel in your body tearing itself apart. She asked me if she was going to die. You can't say no, because they are. And you can't kind of go, yeah, because that's awful. And what do you say? You kind of, you just got to hold their hand and go, it's, it's looking like it's not going to be great. But I can't even remember what I said to her. But yeah, that one, that one got to me. Well done, well done. 
There have been a few like that that have caught me off guard, but they're happening less. Oh, no, don't be silly, that's all right, that's what we're here for. I look up to Dan because, in a way, he's everything that I wish I could be. He doesn't seem that bothered or affected by anything that he sees. But he's not a robot. I've seen him with patients, and he's really, really nice with patients. And he's got that air of calm around him, which you want. Do you want a blanket or something to put your head on? Yeah. What a lovely doctor. Do you want to be more tough? Yeah. I think it would help me just get on with my life if I could be. Morgan's back in recess. She's nearing the end of her rotation. The person who had a headache, nausea and vomiting yesterday evening and then has been found collapsed due to S4, has had two seizures. Her patient is a 62-year-old man who was found collapsed at home. The doctors suspect that Vincent has had a stroke. He was brought in by his wife, Sharon. Just reading Romans 8.28. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one that says all things work for the good. Things may seem really bad, but in the long run, you know, it's going to work out for the good, even if it doesn't work out the way we thought it was going to be. I'm sort of kind of saying to God, you know, I don't want him to live a cabbage life. He wouldn't want that, and I wouldn't want that for him. If it's his time, then I have to prepare myself mentally, really, for that. OK, Vincent, we're going to slide you across now. We're going to do a scan, all right? There's a lot that he's got to look forward to, even though he's had a good life. He's 62. Injection in progress. Twin daughters, both at uni. I'm just saying, OK, God, OK, OK. You got this. I'll be OK. The scan has revealed a massive bleed on Vincent's brain. Yeah, it's big. I don't want to have to tell this lady that her husband's potentially going to die. Please don't. Morgan will have to break the news to Sharon. It's just a rubbish part of our job. It's just part of it. Hello. Hi, you're Vincent's relative, wife. Hi. Hello, my name's Morgan. I'm one of the doctors. So we have done a, a pretty urgent scan on his head, and it has shown that he's, he's had what we think is a stroke. Um, and, he, and he does seem to have a, a bleed on his, on his brain at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's very serious, though. At the moment, he's quite unwell, yeah. 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 Is there anyone you want to call or you want us to talk to? Or... No, the thing is, I lost my mother eight months ago, my brother less than six months ago, in March, and my son in June. <laughs> really, really rough, I, yeah. I keep thinking, who can I call? I don't want to tell anybody, because it's just too much for everybody. Well, we can be here to be your support if you'd like. Thank I know you. we're not relatives <laughs> or friends, but we can be OK. Yeah. And I'm, I'm quite happy just to sit with you if you'd like me to. Probably one of the first times we've had to really do that. Yeah. Their plan is to discuss him in their meeting at eight o'clock, so they should be in there now. I really hope that it turned out well for them. 
but I'm slowly learning. To be able to carry out your job effectively, you just need to learn to detach yourself. Having emotions running really high will not help me help that person. Have a good day, everyone. Oh, it's so bright. And I feel proud of myself for the way that I handled myself there. I was a doctor then. I am a doctor. <gasps> oh, yes. You guys can go now. I'll just sleep like this for a long time. <laughs> Next time, we follow the junior doctors looking after the hospital's youngest patients. We've got the ECG machine. Heart rate. She's now getting to a critical stage where her airway can close off and she may collapse. Children change so quickly. One minute they're well and one minute they're not. And that scares me. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.